All right, well, hello everybody. It's a couple minutes after three, so I think we should get started. Um, we're gonna to talk today about the Ocean Observatories Initiative Coastal and Global Scale Nodes, OOI CGSN. This is a NSF funded uh, program that has multiple elements with multiple organizations contributing and the CGSN is one aspect that we'll talk to you about today. There we go. You'll hear today from myself, uh, Al Paludeman, I'm a project scientist for CGSN, uh, Derek Buffett, the program manager, Sherry White, the system engineering and instrument lead, and joining us also uh, to answer questions is Peter Brickley, uh, operations lead. So what we're gonna do is quickly go through an overview of these different CGSN arrays. What are they, where are they? And then dig in a little bit more into the instrumentation, the platforms, the vehicles that are in the water and then talk about opportunities for uh, looking at data, uh, engaging with the OOI and the CGSN in other ways, and then hopefully have a fair amount of time uh, left for questions. So the OOI was predicated on a series of science themes, high level concepts. Those were broken down into 10 different sort of actionable questions, uh, science questions, and those of those, you can see six of them uh, numbered there on the left-hand side that are particularly relevant to the CGSN infrastructure. I won't go through all these and, and read them out for you, but the idea is that they are interdisciplinary in nature, the science questions, and they are uh, they cover the air-sea interface to the water column and the seafloor below, and they're addressed by different aspects of our uh, infrastructure that you can see there with the check marks on the right. So as an overview of what we have for CGSN, there are two active uh, so-called global arrays uh, that they're part of, uh, they're deployed in the global ocean. You can see them there in the Northern hemisphere, the upper part of that figure, the Station Papa array on the left-hand side and the Ermanger Sea on the right-hand side. These are still uh, operating today. They started out in roughly 2013, 2014 uh, respectively. There are also two other arrays, uh, so-called descoped or decommissioned global arrays in the Southern Ocean and the Argentine Basin. You see those there in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, the lower part of the plot. You can see the years of operation there listed in parentheses. Uh, there are uh, so multiple years of data from both of these arrays, although they are not uh, currently or actively generating data right now. Finally, the coastal array, the New England Shelf Pioneer Array is what's currently installed. You can see it there uh, off of New England. Uh, it will operate up through about 2022 is the plan and then be relocated to the Southern Mid-Atlantic Bight or MAB. And that will start in around 2024. And there's a little more detail on that uh, later on in the, in the slides that I'll present. So the Station Papa Array is roughly 50 North, 145 West about 4,200 meters depth. It's a triangular array at the location of that star that you see in the, in the figure on the right. Uh, the OOI supplies subsurface moorings and gliders. There's also a surface mooring as part of the triangle and that's supplied by the NOAA uh, PMEL lab. The location is of interest because it has strong wind and waves, but maybe more importantly, it has very low uh, eddy kinetic energy. That's what you see contrary in the plot there. Uh, sea surface height variability, and it's pretty low in the center of the uh, Gulf of Alaska there. That makes it amenable to uh, quasi one-dimensional process studies, and there's a long uh, history of such observations being made there. The Erminger Sea is a, a bit different in character. Um, in terms of its environment, it's associated with strong, very strong wind and, and waves intermittently uh, due to the so-called tip jet. You can see a depiction of that there on the right-hand side from uh, satellite wind imagery. And that red, those red colors are winds up to 40 meters per second <clears throat> that are uh, impacting that array, which is a small, uh, sort of as a small white dot right there where my cursor is, is, is where the OI array is. It's at about 2,800 meters depth. It's also a triangular array. In this case, the surface mooring, subsurface moorings and gliders are all supplied by OOI. We're also, uh, collaborating with the OSNAP program. Uh, this is an overturning, overturning uh, in the subpolar North Atlantic program. And uh, they are interested in this area because of North Atlantic deep water formation, which is one of the other compelling aspects of, of this site. 
Finally, the Coastal Pioneer Array. This is the New England Shelf Array that I'm showing here. It's a rectangular uh, mortar array supplemented by gliders and AUVs. It's roughly centered about 100, meter, 100 kilometers south of, sorry, 100 nautical miles south of uh, Cape Cod. It spans the shelf break front at the edge of the continental shelf, which is shown there as a sort of stippled uh, region in the figure. And it's focused on understanding cross-shelf exchange and the influence of the Gulf Stream uh, on this area. As I noted, the Pioneer Array is going to relocate. This was part of the vision for OOI and for the Pioneer Array at the beginning of the program. It was announced in 2020 at the Ocean Sciences meeting that it would be relocated. And the first part of that has been completed. The first phase or first two phases were so-called innovations labs or essentially uh, community workshops that determined the location and proposed a conceptual design for the platforms and locations and sensors. And so this is kind of where we've gotten to with that process now. The idea is to relocate the Pioneer Array off uh, just south of uh, like Virginia Beach and the Chesapeake Bay outflow on the continental shelf and slope. It would be perhaps or, or nominally a T-shaped array uh, that would span about 50 to 500 meters depth within the region of that red uh, box that you see in the figure, supplemented by gliders and AUVs within, uh, within that green box. There are a variety of compelling uh, science questions that were brought up in these, these workshops. And I guess an overarching statement is that we are hoping to uh, utilize the relocation and, and modest uh, re-engineering and procurement aspect of this to increase our focus or enhance our ability to do biological and biogeochemical measurements. And I think with that, oh, so I wanted to finish off that process. Uh, that last slide is like where we are now. Where are we going? In 2021 to 23, there's a lot of work to do within the CGSN program. We've got to characterize the site, uh, the environment, look at permitting, water space management, engineering, procurement, et cetera. So we're going to give ourselves a window to accomplish that by recovering the New England Shelf Pioneer Array from it for its final uh, deployment in 2022 and then deploying in the Southern MAB in uh, 2024. So that's the kind of uh, thumbnail sketch of how that relocation will work. And with that, which is the whirlwind tour of our whirlwind tour of our broad scale uh, infrastructure for CGSN, I'm going to turn it over to Sherry, who's going to talk about the instruments and then the platform. Thanks, Al. Uh, so first, just a quick overview of some of the core instrumentation that OOI has deployed um, on the various platforms. So you see on this slide and the next, a list of all of our instruments. These are all primarily commercial off-the-shelf instruments. Um, you see we have a variety of vendors, Seabird, Andera, Teledyne RDI, um, and you can see all the makes and models of the various instruments. Um, we tend to use these five-letter codes for the different models that we're deploying. So you can see the CTDBP is a Seabird 16 plus V2 uh, CTD instrument. And uh, if you're looking on the um, in the data portals for some of the data or in some of the uh, upcoming slides you'll see we'll be referring to the instruments in in this way so this just gives you a, a brief primer to uh, what that terminology is uh, the one instrument that's not uh, actually a commercial off-the-shelf instrument is the direct covariance flux instrument that we refer to as fdchp and that um it was developed here at hui the dcfs and um, so that is another one we're deploying. Next slide, you can continue to see a variety of optical instruments from wet labs, uh, some uh, instruments from Setlantic, which is now covered by Seabird and wet labs, and then some carbon instruments from Proceanus, Sunburst, and bioacoustic sonars from ASL. So a large variety of instruments to measure a variety of properties uh, in the water column. Next slide. So these instruments all kind of interface a little bit differently, but we're capable of, of dealing with a lot of different instrumentation. So in some cases, they're self-powered with either alkaline or lithium batteries. They can also be powered by our infrastructure. So we plug them into what we call the, the DCL, which is a platform controller component that provides power to the instrument and also logs the data. And those DCLs are capable of providing 12 or 24 volts to an instrument. 
Sometimes uh, the instruments are self-recording. Uh, sometimes we connect with a direct serial or ethernet connection. And sometimes we can communicate with them inductively along the mooring line. The, they're mounted kind of to a variety of locations on the infrastructure from the, the top of the tower to the bottom side of the buoy and on inline frames uh, all the way down to um, the multifunction node on the sea floor. And in some cases even clamped directly onto the inductive wire rope. And the way they are sampled is, is uh, based on both what the instrument uh, itself is capable of doing and then also on uh, kind of the strategy that we need to address the science questions that Al mentioned earlier. So the way that we sample all of our instruments is, is defined and captured in this document called the OOI Observation and Sampling Approach document. And um, you can see the document number now that can be found in Alfresco, our document management system. Next slide. So more details about the moorings themselves. We have kind of two main types of moorings. Uh, one type has a surface expression and one type doesn't, it's purely subsurface. The ones with the surf surface expression all have a somewhat common design. They include the coastal profile moorings, the coastal surface moorings and the global surface moorings. The, uh, the surface moorings, both coastal and global, do their own power generation. They, um, they all use a common type of platform controller data logging component, uh, as I mentioned, the DCL. Um, and then they all have the same type of satellite and line of sight communications. The subsurface moorings are the global profile moorings and the global flanking moorings. Those are, are a common design, they're battery powered. They use a special low power platform controller to do the data logging and they have uh, acoustic communications only. So there are gliders that operate in the vicinity of the global arrays and they're able to communicate acoustically with these moorings so that they can either send commands to these moorings or um, get the data from the moorings and send them, to, send them on to shore. Next slide. So the coastal pioneer array looks a little bit like this. You see, we have seven sites. Um, at those sites, we have three surface moorings, um, which are these kind of larger buoys here. Uh, we have five coastal profile moorings at, um, at these sites. There are two sites, um, the intra site and the central site where we deploy a profile mooring in the winter. And in the summer, we use profiling gliders to enable us to better cover the water column. And then there's five gliders and two AUVs that we operate in the vicinity. So I'll talk you through uh, each type of mooring. The coastal profile mooring looks like this. You can see the diagram on the left. It has a submersible surface buoy. That means it's able to be pulled under the water if conditions get rough. Um, that buoy contains the main controlling element, which in this case is called an STC, but it's the same type of component as the DCL. There are telemetry components on the tower that allow for iridium communications and also line of sight communications uh, via free wave or Wi-Fi. And there's inductive communications all the way down the mooring line. It's powered entirely by primary batteries, which are in the bottom part of the buoy. There is a stretch hose component that kind of decouples the wave motion experienced by the buoy from the subsurface sphere, which holds the rest of the mooring taut. There's an inductive wire rope uh, back, please. Thanks. There's inductive wire rope with the profiler that's able to crawl up and down, and then um, an ADCP upward looking to collect the uh, velocity profile of the water. Uh, the bottom part of the mooring, there's an anchor with line packs. We are required to recover uh, all the anchors from, um, from this site, so, so we're able to recover the entire mooring. And next slide, you can see some pictures of the different components. So these are the, the profilers that, that go up and down. Here's the sub surface, uh, sorry, submersible buoys uh, with the telemetry components on top, the subsurface sphere, and um, also the ADCPs and, and line packs. Next slide. The coastal surface mooring has a, a larger surface buoy at the surface. It, um, the plat main platform control components are the DCL and, and another component, which we call the CPM, um, which, which controls all the telemetry and power. We do have a redundant uh, satellite iridium communications and line of sight uh, via free wave and Wi-Fi. And we also have the ability to do acoustic uh, communications with instrumentation in the water column. All the power is generated by the wind turbines, which you can see here, and solar panels, which are on the deck and the vane. And, and uh, 
they uh, recharge the batteries that are in the buoy well. The riser consists of a mooring chain, uh, some EM cable, and then sections of stretch hose that enable this to be a taut, uh, taut mooring. Instrumentation is located at the, at the buoy on the top of the tower, uh, on the buoy itself in a near surface instrument frame, which hangs at about seven meters depth below the buoy. And then also on the seafloor on the multifunction node. And you can see here are instrument codes that show what is where. So there's around 20 instruments that are on this type of mooring. Next slide. And here's some pictures of the different components. This is the, the MFN, the multifunction node, which sits on the seafloor. You can see some of the uh, acoustic components. That's a bioacoustic sonar here. This is the near surface instrument frame, which hangs in the water. And then of course, you've got the buoy shown here with all the telemetry and meteorological instrumentation on the top. You can also, from this image, see the uh, PV panels that are on the vein and also on the deck. The global array, we have, um, as we said, three to four moorings, depending on the site. So a, a surface mooring, which is at one point, point of the array that we call the apex, uh, also a global um, profiling mooring near it, and then the two flanking moorings, which are on the other corners. The sides of this array are approximately 10 times the water depth. There are two open ocean gliders which swim around the periphery of the array, and these are the gliders that have acoustic communications, and so they're able to communicate with the subsurface moorings, collect the data from those moorings, and um, transmit it to shore when they surface. Uh, there's also a profiling glider in the vicinity of the profile of mooring, and it profiles the upper 200 meters. Next slide. So the surface mooring here is very similar to the coastal surface mooring. It's the same type of buoy. Uh, it's a little bit taller, a little more flotation, but other than that, it has the same type of controller, same type of telemetry, except that it also has inductive communications for instrumentation that's clamped on the wire. Um, same type of power system as the coastal surface mooring. Once again, a chain, it's got an instrument frame, um, this time hanging about 12 meters below the surface. And then it has a long inductive wire rope section in which instruments are clamped directly onto the wire. There's also an inline frame with an ADCP at 500 meters, which is upward looking. Uh, this is not a top mooring. You can see that inverse catenary of synthetic portions at the bottom that, that uh, go all the way down to the anchor at the sea floor. There are no, there's no instrumentation on this mooring below 1500 meters. So. Next slide. These are just some uh, images of what the surface mooring looked like. So you can see a nice picture of the halo and all the meteorological and telemetry components on the halo and some drawings of what the near surface instrument frame looked like. Uh, next slide shows the uh, surface mooring, uh, the uh, sorry, the surface buoy just before it gets deployed. Uh, so you can see the long chain connecting it to the NSIF, which is getting ready to be put over the side. And then on the lower left, you can see a number of the instruments that are mounted directly onto the wire as that mooring is, um, is deployed. So power is only transmitted down to the, the NSIF, as you see there, everything below that is um, battery powered instruments and inductive communications. Next slide. These are the flanking mooring. So I said, this is a subsurface mooring. The top sphere is at about 30 meters. Um, there's also a midwater sphere at about 500 meters. So there are two different controller components. The main controller is in the load cage, which is actually down at 1500 meters. Secondary controller is in the top sphere at 30 meters. As I said, there's inductive communications along this mooring and then acoustic modem communications to the gliders in order to get data to shore. Uh, everything on this mooring is powered by batteries. And the instrumentation is in the, uh, there's a, a set of instruments in the upper sphere at 30 meters, and then a variety of instrumentation clamped along the wire down to 1500 meters. And then um, in the sphere is an upward looking ADCP at 500 meters. At the Erminger site, uh, Al mentioned that we are um, kind of part of the OSNAP array at that location. And so there are actually a set of uh, CTDs and velocity sensors on the bottom portion of the mooring that are uh, at equivalent heights of the OSNAP moorings. Those are not inductive. Um, they're only um, self-recording and we get that data at the end, but that enables us to kind of um, collaborate, merge with the OSNAP program. Next slide. These are a picture of what some of the components look like on the left. 
you can see the top spheres um, closest to the uh, camera and then the subsurface spheres behind them. Uh, this, the center slide has a subsurface sphere with the ADCP in it and the load cage with the controller in front of it. That's the controller getting deployed in the top right. Um, and uh, a flotation section in the center in the bottom right uh, enables this mooring to actually be split in two. So when we recover it, we're able to recover the top flotation section first and then the, the midwater flotation and the rest of the mooring after that. Next slide. So the global profile of mooring is really similar. Uh, you see the same top sphere. This time it's at 150 meters. You also um, see a midwater sphere. This is for the, the moorings that are in the deeper locations, such as Station Papa at Erminger, actually, because it is, um, it's much shallower. There is no midwater sphere. So there is actually two 80, um, profilers, as you see in this image at the Station Papa site. At the Erminger site, there is only one profiler that goes up and down. So once again, these have a, a controller and a load cage that's down at depth. There's only inductive and acoustic communications. Everything's powered by batteries. And um, there's a profiler making measurements throughout the water column and then also um, an ADCP in the, um, at the top of that inductive rope section. And these are what the components look like. So that's the mid the sorry the top sphere on the right hand side and you can see the actually the uh, acoustic transducers for the bioacoustic sonars there's one at the top that looks up and then one at the bottom um, which is downward looking so we're able to get um, more of the water column and then you see the profile being mounted on the line there so for the vehicles, um, we have at the Pioneer Array a number of gliders. These are Teledyne Web Slocum gliders um, using either a 200 or 1,000 meter buoyancy engine. Uh, we have two flavors of gliders that we deploy at the Pioneer Array, a coastal glider and a profiling glider. And um, you can see that the instrumentation is uh, similar, but slightly different between those. Uh, the next slide shows kind of how we deploy those. So the the main coastal gliders are deployed along the track lines that you see there, um, given the different colors, uh, eastern boundary, frontal zone. Uh, the Gulf Stream is crossed out. We have deployed at that site, but that, um, that track line was kind of de-scoped, so there's, there's not as much data from that site. The two orange circles show where the profiling gliders are deployed. Those are the inshore and the central sites. And so they, um, rather than traveling track lines, they hold their position near the glider and do profiles at least uh, four times a day. The open ocean gliders, also we have two types of gliders at the, at the um, global sites. So the open ocean are the ones that travel between the, the uh, moorings, so around the perimeter of the array. They're also Teledyne Web Slocum gliders. They are the ones that communicate with the subsurface moorings and uh, serve as data mules, getting the data to shore. They have a much smaller set of instrumentation, as you can see there, and that's because a, a large amount of power is needed to uh, handle the acoustic communications, and they are deployed for a full year. Um, so they, they're a little bit limited on how much they can collect. Uh, also at the global sites, we have the profiling gliders. Um, so like the pro profiling gliders at the coastal site, they hold position uh, near the profile mooring and um, collect profiles in the upper 200 meters. So this is above where the um, MMP actually can profile. You can see they have a larger set of instrumentation um, that they're able to do because they don't have to do the acoustic communications as well. And uh, once again, these are deployed for a year. Uh, Pioneer also has AUVs. We operate two Remus 600 AUVs. These are deployed from, the, from a ship only. Uh, they do two-day deployments and we operate them concurrently. So uh, you can see a small dashed lines in the vicinity of the, the dots, which is the mortar ray in that figure. And so uh, we'll have an AUV traveling uh, along the shelf and across the shelf simultaneously uh, making measurements. You can see there the instrumentation that's um, on the AUVs. And so these are deployed from the ship when we do our regular um, Pioneer Ray turns, which happen every six months. So once in the spring, once in the fall. And then also they're deployed from smaller ships when we do our coastal um, glider turns, which happen every two to three months, uh, depending on the weather. And that is it for the instrumentation. Thanks, Sherry. So I'll talk about different opportunities for the community to interact with the observatory. If we go to the next slide, 
So data access, um, you can interact with the data through the OOI net data portal and the data explorer that provides uh, simple searches and data visualization and uh, on-demand processing of the recovered and the tele telemeter data. And then for the more savvy user or higher volume user, there's also three other uh, op uh, options to interact with the data through the raw data server, an ERDAP server and an M2M. And if you have any questions uh, concerning the uh, instrument data, the metadata, uh, the sites themselves, the platforms or the instruments, we also have an OOI help desk uh, that can provide answers and you can interact with the different members of the team uh, depending on the uh, subject. If we go to the next slide. So this is, this is one, uh, I think is a high point of the observatory. It's the observatory is not static, it's dynamic. The scientific com community can interact with us and the observatory to modify the sampling to suit your um, science needs. You can add instrumentation to the platforms as part of different proposals. Uh, we can add platforms to the array, uh, uh, depending on uh, what they might be. Uh, ancillary work can be performed on the cruises, for example, deploying uh, third party gliders or drifters or floaters, uh, performing different types of sampling. Um, and the process would be you can you can make a request through the help desk uh, and we'll provide OOI personnel to support that request. We can support feasibility studies and perform cost ass assessments to support PI proposals. Uh, we can review and provide uh, approval awaiting for the pr proposal funding. Uh, and we'll support integration and testing of third party instruments uh, and platforms and ensure that they, they interact correctly with the observatory and that the data can be, uh, if is, uh, it's required, uh, telemetered real time, similar to the OOI data itself. Um, and we can also provide the logistics coordination, uh, interacting with the instruments or the platforms uh, while they're deployed and support the deployments themselves from the vessels during our own array turns. We go to the next slide. So several points of contact for the community. Uh, we have the help desk, which is uh, can be found directly on the oceanobservatories.org website. There's also discourse that we use for interacting with the science community uh, and as well as directly through the help desk from the Ocean Observatories website. Or you can get in touch with us directly, myself or Al or Sherry or any other member of the team that you might have access to, and those are our emails. So go to the next slide. Uh, sorry, I can't, there we go, <laughs> done. <laughs> done. Questions. Um, yeah, thanks for your attention. Uh, great job going through the material. And um, I think some of you have already figured out that we're uh, looking for your comments in the, in the chat box, if there are some in there. Um, Darlene Truchrist is uh, gonna help us kind of curate those questions. If you, uh, let's see, it's not such a big group. I think we could probably go with a, you know, a, if you wanna raise a hand, although I can't really see everyone on my screen, anyone's anyway. So I think the chat is the best place to get your question and we'll, uh, read that question out and answer it. Hi there, right now, here we go. <laughs> I do have a question. What is the most exciting discovery that has been produced by the CGSN arrays? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I don't know that I could just give one, one answer, but you, know, you could kind of march around the, the different arrays. Uh, there's been some really interesting work at the Ermier C array showing First of all, that deep convection happens there at all, which was not really known until we started. And then how prevalent it is and how the, the deeper basin actually interacts with the boundary currents to create and then transport that deep water uh, around the global ocean. So to me, that was really fascinating part of uh, what's been learned at Erminger Sea. And if you go, for example, to the Pioneer Array, uh, some of you have heard me tell this story before, but we proposed the idea for that array or the community did that there would be slow, weak 
uh, hard to detect interactions that we would need many years of data to use a statistical approach to find the shelf slope exchange. What we found was really different. The shelf slope exchange in the years the array has been out there anyway, is dominated by strong, short-term, uh, intense events. Um, Kind of mediated by the Gulf Stream and its uh, eddies and meanders. So those are two examples. There are actually lots of them um, and lots of publications that have uh, focused on what I've said there. Thank you, Al. And Tim Shanahan, and this might be directed to Derek. Are there any plans for updating CGSN to include new technologies as new commercially available products become available? So the answer to that is yes. Uh, we've actually implemented a, a tech refresh process um, where we prioritize the instrumentation uh, based on uh, data quality and our operational interactions with them. Um, and that'll include uh, going out to other potential vendors, uh, creating a test, you know, gathering information about alternative uh, instrumentation putting together a test program for those instruments and, and doing test deployments. And once we have that information and the data from the test deployments, potentially implementing that new te technology. Um, the other opportunity we have is as part of the pioneer relocation, the new science questions uh, are gonna allow us to look at new instrumentation that could potentially be mounted to the moorings to answer those new questions. Thank you, Derek. And here's another one. What are some technological challenges that have been overcome? And Sherry, do you want to take that? Well, there's, I guess there's a variety of stuff that could be, um, that could be said here. I guess I'll give uh, one example. A number of instruments that we use are really subject to biofouling, um, and that's really limited their effectiveness after, say, six weeks or so. So for doing long-term deployments, that's, that's been a bit of a challenge. We've started implementing UV lights on our dissolved oxygen sensors and our spectral irradiance sensors, and that has helped to keep them clean and pristine for even the year-long deployments at some sites. And so, so that's been that's been really great from the instrumentation side. Yeah, Thank I think you. I think another one we could say is uh, power reliability on the moorings, increasing the uh, the delivery of power to the instrumentation, where we've implemented automated controls where the power systems dependent on, uh, for example, uh, the weather at Erminger, uh, the turbines can shunt power so that they will not be damaged during a storm event, so that when the storm event passes, they're still available to generate power. So, you know, power management is a significant advance and, and something we're always looking into. Here's another one. What science questions will be answered at the new Pioneer site? Al? Uh, yeah, I had, I, I glossed over some of those, I had them up, uh, on one of the slides, but uh, as I recall, you know, there is still, it's not wholly different from the New England Shelf Array in that there's still a focus on cross-shelf exchange, but the processes uh, that are mediating that exchange are, are expected to be different, and there's a stronger emphasis on the biogeochemical aspects, for example, the uh, coastal carbon cycle. Uh, the interaction between uh, the benthic biology and water column biology, um, influence of storms, and in this case, uh, outflow, for example, from the Chesapeake Bay, uh, where things like freshwater outflow was not a, not a factor at the New England Shelf site, but will be at the Southern MAB. So um, there are some sort of familiar high-level concepts about shelf slope exchange, and then some unique uh, regionally specific uh, kind of processes that we think are mediating that exchange. So I think it'll be fascinating to, uh, to dig into that. This is the last opportunity. Does anybody have further questions? Please just um, type your name and I'll unmute you. <laughs> I'll give you 30 seconds. While we wait, I would just um, encourage everyone to get involved in OOI. It's really um, based on community needs, and we try to deliver data as quickly and as easily as possible to meet your needs. So I throw it over to you, Al. Yeah, uh, 
that's a great sum up, probably exactly what, what I would have said. Thanks, everybody, for your attention. Um, if you do have questions or thoughts that occur to you afterwards, uh, we gave you those, those links for the various ways to get in touch with us through the help desk. And, and please reach out with questions or, or inquiries of how to get involved. Yeah, like one more question on the QA. Ah, oh, I didn't see it. I didn't either. Sorry. It's from Nicholas Bernardo. How did you come to agree on 90 meters as a subsurface deployment depth? Any difficulties with fishing gear, marine life? Um, boy, I wonder which 90 meters we're talking about. If that's the pioneer, shallowest depth of the pioneer, New England Shelf Pioneer Array, that was uh, determined by the phenomena we were interested in, the location of the shelf break front, and also water space management, uh, negotiation with uh, commercial fishermen and, and other uh, water space users. If you mean the depths of the subsurface components and the global moorings, those were determined mostly by environmental uh, conditions. You know, how, if you get try to get too close to the surface, you'll be suffered from uh, excessive motion from uh, wind and waves and currents, as well as um, biofouling will be worse. Uh, we do have occasional interactions with fishing gear. Uh, it's been, I guess, fairly modest since some early, uh, early uh, issues that we thought might be bad, but they tended to abate, I think, once the fishing community figured out where things were and what they were. And we've had, I think only one suspected interaction with marine life that damaged a glider, right? As far as I know, that's our only, uh, and even that is not, not known whether that really happened uh, that way or not. It might've been a non, might've been a human, uh, human vehicle rather than a marine life that, that uh, damaged it. And Nicholas, I've given you permission to um, say yes or no and ask Al further questions if he didn't address your question specifically. There's another question um, from Anthony Schnazel. Anti-falling on ADCP transducers. Sherry, I'll ship that to you. Yeah, we um, so we tend to use desitin um, on the ADCP transducers. That's been fairly effective for us at the at the deeper sites. We don't really need to use anything. Uh, they don't get that biofoul, but certainly at the shallower sites, uh, it's a bit of a problem. Um, the desitin seems to work fine. Our colleagues at Oregon State University have worked a little bit with testing um, clear signal and some other types of biofouling on some of their transducers. So we have transducers on the ADCPs, on the bioacoustic sonars, and then also on the, um, the other single point velocity instruments. So the, we have a lot of different places to worry about. Um, and um, they haven't found them, you know, Super effective. I think in more cases, they're, they're, they're better when you're cleaning them off, but not necessarily preventing stuff from sticking during the deployment. So it's, it's, always, um, it's always a little tricky, but we also have found that, you know, some of the, the biofouling we do get on those transducers, the minimal amount, don't seem to affect the data too much. So. Does that answer your question, Anthony? Yes, thank you. Great. Anyone else? Well, thank you. I turn it over to Al for closing. Sure. I mean, I'll just close really briefly again. Thanks to the panelists. You did a great job. Thanks to uh, the audience for tuning in. Uh, we're excited about continuing this, this experiment and this, uh, this adventure and getting your, your input in and uh, engagement. So with that, we'll close the webinar for today.